بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم السلام علی الحسین و علی علی ابن الحسین و علی اولاد الحسین و علی اصحاب الحسین السلام علیکم ایوریوان وی انتر دی منت اف محرم اف ایر 1445 We start with a great lecture by uh, our sister Amina Yovan, who is a PhD student in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago, where she is a student coordinator for the Persian Circle and the She Studies Symposium. She received her master's degree in Middle Eastern and North African Studies from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Uh, Amina's research interests intersect at the history of political and economic power and historical literature in the early Islamic period. His uh, speech tonight would be on poetry and Karbala. Please, uh, sister. Hello, salam to everyone. Um, I'm just going to begin with two of, I think, the most famous lines of poetry that have to do with um, the first 10 days of Muharram. Baz in che shurish ast ke dar khalq alam ast. Baz in che nohe o che aza o che matam ast. These two lines of poetry from Muhtasham Kashani, one of the most famous Iranian poems that have to do with the events of Karbala, were really what inspired the speech that I'm going to be giving today. Um, and I wanted to start with them and start with my con uh, with my uh, consolations for everybody for the next 10 days. Um, before I begin, I want to set out a few things in advance. First, I know that this speech is a very basic and very introductory understanding of how poetry and the uh, events, events of Ashura and Karbala intersect, but I think it is worth it for us to look at them in a little bit more depth. Um, and second, much of the work that I'm speaking about here is not my own work. It's taken from, one, a number of different translations and also from a number of different scholars, most notably Khalid Sindawi, who has done a great deal of work on the Maqtal and on Marathi and generally um, different martyrdom narrations and poetry more generally relating to Imam Hussein Ali Salam. So to set it out very at the very beginning, this is a very basic speech, and I hope that you will accept my apologies for it. Um, but yes, my talk really began when I began to think about the poetry of Muhtasham Kashani and how it really played a part in our understanding of the events of Karbala and in how those events are generally commemorated. In an article that I read from, I think, the Tehran Times, they said that these first two lines are some of the most well-known and copied verses that are seen and inscribed on buildings throughout the Middle East and India, specifically in this case, I think, primarily in Iraq, Iran, and India, and Pakistan. While I think that there is some hyperbole in this statement, the article talked about it as being the most comp some of the most commonly inscribed lines found anywhere, and I have some doubts about this. It is definitely true that these two lines are some of the most well-known lines of Persian poetry more generally today. Furthermore, these lines are not just limited to their own time and space. They're very important in Sinazani and Nohe and Latmiyas and how we think about how we commemorate Imam Hussein alayhi salam in the poetry of today. They speak to the larger role of poetry in our remembrance of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and in our mourning of, the, of him, and kind of gives weight to a lot of the traditions that we see, both in the form of majalis or um, the Rose uh, Khuni in Farsi, but also in Latmiya and Nohe, and in specifically in the invocation and performance of poetry among a group of people. How did that tradition really manifest, however, and how has it developed? It might be easy to see it as a kind of a historical thing that we have had poetry about Imam Hussein and we have had the performance of poetry about Imam Hussein and remembering Imam Hussein from the very beginning of time where this event took place, that it begins right after Karbala. And that's definitely true. There is no doubt that 
almost immediately afterwards, there is poet, there, from the event itself, we have poetry that is remembered and recited continuously. However, in reality, there's a lot of variety, and that variety becomes elided if we see it all as the same kind of thing. Um, the variety of types of poetry, of methods of transmission, and of methods of performance add cultural relevance, emotional resonance, and moral depth to the poetry itself. It is not just poetry, but it is religious action. And so what I really wanted to look at was how these different forms are used in this type of religious praxis, of, in religious practice, and how we can integrate that into how we think about our own practices today and the purposes that our practices serve. However, I only have 35 minutes and I am a very poor scholar, so we're going to be speaking primarily about the very beginning of poetry in Karbala and the events of Ashura. This poetry is entirely in Arabic. While I begin, began with Muhtasham Kashani and Persian poetry, I will not get to that today, but I welcome anybody else's scholarship who wants to take this forward and any uh, resources to further expand on the work that I'm doing here tonight. Um, and it is all of the time of the Imams. This does not go into discussions of how people really remembered the Imam and Karbala after the Ghaiba of Imam Mahdi Ajala Tala Faraj al Sharif, um, but very much of the time of the Imam it's, uh, himself. We're going to be looking at two primary periods. One is in, during and immediately after Karbala. So the very immediate poetry that we see emerging by the end of the Umayyad period. And the second is going to be later on when there is a little bit more leeway in the role of the imams and they have a little bit more speaking power and a little bit more power to disseminate information among their followers, what kind of poetry and what kind of practices we see emerge. So to begin with, to start, we must speak about poetry as it appears in narratives of Karbala itself and immediately afterwards. And to do that, we need to speak very briefly about the history of poetry in the Arabic language. Poetry had, had had, at this point, by the time of Karbala, a very long history. It had defined forms and it had defined conventions and genres. The two that are most important for us here are going to be the Qita and the Qasida. The Qasida is, of course, the multi-thematic, um, multi longer-form poetry that is found primarily in pre-Islamic poetry at this time. There is, as we're going to talk about, a slight falling off during the Islamic period, and it follows specific conventions in what the parts are going to be, how the speaker addresses his audience, and the different themes that he'll use. On the other hand, the Qita is a short-form poetry. It's usually quite short. Some of them are only one line long, up to maybe, say, 10 lines at most, that are singularly themed. They usually have to do with some sort of historical event or are discussing a historical event. Um, and they are much simpler and much more improvised. However, they both play very important roles when we think about the narratives and historical elements that we see in the early Islamic period. There is in scholarship, discussion of a chill in poetry that emerges alongside Islam, that with the coming of Islam and the Prophet wasallam, there is kind of a, a reduction in the creation of poetry, or at least that the number of qasidas being written on the pre-Islamic modes is reduced. This is somewhat controversial and quite nuanced, and so I don't want to really get into it here. But that kind of chill during the time of the Prophet and the Medinan Caliphate means that we have different modes of poetry being created in this time. So, for example, the Qata, that improvised form, takes on an increased importance. It comments a lot more in historical narratives on events that are happening on the ground and how people respond to those events. That poetry, even though it's more improvised, it's not quite as formal anymore in this time period, it's still the shared language of the people and part of the mark of cultural relevance. People create poetry and they quote it, they use it. These qitas get passed down as well. 
And so as we see, there is going to be this form of poetry that envelops the narratives of Karbala, this short form poetry that gets integrated from the very beginning into retelling the story of Karbala. However, with the coming of the Umayyad court, there is also a second track. So that was during the prophetic and the Medinan period, but during, but during the time of the Umayyad caliphate, there's also the return to a court culture and the return to a culture that prides itself on this type of long form cultural production and the visibility of the arts. So we see, and this will be explored as well. So there's this kind of increased um, vision of poets that parallels the rise of the short, the short form poetry. And so these two very different contexts manifest in different ways. The first is in the retelling of the maqtal as mentioned, and the second is in the rise of long form elegies on Imam Hussein alayhi salam that even appears during the Umayyad period. So let's begin by thinking a little bit about the, the integration of this type of short form poetry into the story of Karbala. I'm not going to go over all of them here. There's numerous one line, two line, three line remembrances that show up when we're talking about the poetry integrated into the narratives. Many of them are battle forms. So they talk about what people will say as they're going into battle. Many of them are also statements of support for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So when people are coming forward and saying that they will join the side of Imam Hussein, they do so with the recitation of say two or three lines of poetry. And finally, and what I'm going to actually begin speaking about here and reciting here are very short pieces that are actually written, spoken by and created by Imam Hussein alayhi salam himself. And so one of the most famous lines that we see are the lines spoken here by Imam Hussein alayhi salam that are heard by his son, Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam, on the night of Taswa. Ya dahru ufin laka min khalili, kam laka bil ishraqi wal asili, min sahibin aw talibin qatili. Wa dahru la yaqna'u bil badili, wa innama al-amru ila al-jalili, wa kullu hayyin saliku al-sabili. Time, shame on you as a friend. At the day's dawning and the sun's setting, how many a companion or seeker will be killed? Time will not be satisfi satisfied with a substitute. The matter will rest with the Almighty, and every ling be living being journeys along the path. These lines are spoken about the are spoken by Imam Hussein alayhi salam the night before he goes into battle. They're heard by his son, Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam, who immediately, he says, realizes the hopelessness of their position and feels the weight of, of the day coming settle in on himself. The women also hear the story, specifically Sayyida Zainab sallallahu alayha, and she begins verbally mourning and crying for the death of her brother. And so Imam Hussein alayhi salam thus provides them with comfort and, and advice at this point. So this short qita has two very different but important functions. One within the context of the people who are going through this event, and the second in the context of us as readers of narratives that use this poetry. So within the story, the poem serves a really important role, and it is unquestioned by everyone who hears it. Everyone who hears this poem recognizes the importance, the weight of what will happen just upon hearing these three lines of poetry. Nobody is surprised that the Imam is writing or saying lines of poetry that he has himself created, nor are they surprised at how he expresses himself. It is a natural part of his community and the weight that he has in his community. However, from the perspective of us as readers, it also acts like a signpost. This is the time when the story shifts in different narratives. This poetry is found both in the works of Shia scholars, but also in historical, in historical tales that are very um, focused on the story of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. From here, we enter the bleak period, the 
the bitterness of Ashura has really taken over the story. And so the, we can see that the people who are writing poetry are aware of the effect that it will have. People reading and incorporating it into their historical tales are aware that it, of the effect that it will have not just on the audience listening, but also on the readers and those who are hearing the story secondhand. This is one of the most moving pieces of poetry that we have. However, that is not to say that the other short form battle verses are also not equally moving. So for example, one of the most well-known examples of these short form battle, battle fragments, which is also extremely moving and found in modern maqtals very often, is said by um, Ali al-Akbar as he's going into battle. He says, Ana Ali ibn al-Husayn ibn Ali, nahnu wa rabbu al-bayti awla bin nabi, tallahi la yahkumu fina ibn al-da'i. I am Ali, son of Hussein, son of Ali. By God, we are most favored by the Prophet, and the son of a bastard shan't judge us by Allah. He says this as he is going into battle, but he is not the only person to do so. For example, right before this, there is also Habib ibn Mudahir, who upon fighting says, Ana Habib wa Abi Mudahir, Farisu Heja wa Harbu Tasar. I am Habib, my father is Mudahir, a horseman of battle and war that is kindled. He goes on, You are more numerous than we, but we are more loyal and steadfast than you. Ours is stronger logic and clearer right. We are of greater pity, pity, sorry, greater piety and freer from blame than you. He is not the only one to do this. al hur does the same thing. Zuhair ibn Qayn does the same thing. Even people who can't really recite poetry try their best. We have in the same kind of narratives from Al-Tabari and Al-Yaqubi that Nafi' ibn Hilal, when going through, can't really, he, do, he can't pr provide poetry, but he still tries when going into battle saying, Ana al-Jamali. I am al Jamali and I am for the religion of Ali. The combination of all of these um, different forms and the repetition of them again forms a really important cultural layer to understanding how people express themselves and how poetry fit into the events where they saw themselves. The use of this type of poetry is not simply flavor for the reader, but in fact, it, it was an important part of how they expressed themselves, not only before battle, but in readiness to meet Allah and to express who they thought was on the side of right. We see this because not only are there numerous references and numerous types of poetry from the side of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and his supporters, but there's actually a great deal of literary production also from the enemy's side doing something sig uh, similar. In fact, there is a, uh, a man who goes into battle and he actually fights in an unchivalrous attack against Burair ibn Khudair, one of, the, one of the martyrs of Karbala. Upon his return, he is remonstrated by a female relative, possibly his wife or his sister, about his actions, saying that I cannot believe that you fought against the... Um, the son of the daughter of the prophet. And he recites poetry, shaming her, trying to shame her and declaring his support for Yazid. So it is worth noting that we have this kind of similar production happening on the enemy side. This isn't necessarily just a literary trope, but something that was an integral part of how people express themselves and the trauma that they found themselves in, the events that they found themselves um, really experiencing. However, there is definitely in this early period a difference in the types of production that we have. Um, I think I have time and I can read at least the English of the, um, the enemy's poetry, I, just because I want us to hear the differences of it. He, I don't want to read the whole thing, but he speaks in this type of elevated language. He talks about how I had with me a spear from Yazan, whose joints had not betrayed it, and a white sword which was sharpened and both edges of it were cutting. I singled him out amid a group who was whose religion was not mine, for I was for I am satisfied in Yaz, with Yazid. Uh, 
My eyes did not see their like in their time, nor anyone among the people before them since I was a young man. He goes on and describes this and continues. This is a very long piece of poetry compared to the rest of the qita's, which are at most, say, one or two lines. In this early period, we could say that all of the qita's and poetry that we've that we've seen prior to this, both those of Imam Hussein and the pieces that are set in battle are very simple and direct. They are responding to or enhanced by the events that are happening in Karbala. But those of others are definitely more elaborate. They are more courtly. And so the this language of elaboration in, early, in the early period is not really the purview of the righteous who are speaking impromptu, who are speaking on the ground, but of those who survive and many who do survive are the unrighteous, those on the side of the caliph. That is not, however, the end of the story because, of course, the imams come out in support of remembering the story of Imam Hussein alayhi salam through poetry. So while there is this really simple poetry that is used in developing the narrative and the story of Imam Hussein and in the narrations of the story of Imam Hussein at the same time, poets are also sharpening their skills in the Umayyad court and giving way to a more developed, a more courtly elegiac poetry specifically about the family of the prophet. One of the most famous of these is the poetry of Al-Farazdaq, who was associated with associated both with Imam Hussein alayhi salam, but also specifically with the Umayyad court, and was known for his flightings or his or his satirical poetry given in court. However, in one story, it's said that um, Al-Farazdaq was going to Hajj, where the later Umayyad cal uh, caliph Hisham was also there. Hisham, upon seeing that Imam uh, Ali Zayn al Abidin alayhi salam was receiving a lot of welcomes and good tidings from the people, becomes very incensed and essentially says something along the lines of, Who is this person? I don't even know who this person is. And Farazdaq stands up and begins to declaim another impromptu poem. This is a much longer one. Um, on the qualities of Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam and also of the family of the Prophet. I don't have time now to read the entirety of the poem, but I just wanted to give a few of the lines. Um, this is the son of Hussein and the grandson of Fatima, the daughter of the apostle through whom the darkness dispersed. This is he whose ability the Valley of Mecca recognizes. He is known by the sacred house and the holy sanctuary and the lands outside of the, the Kaaba, the sanctuary. This is the son of the best of God's servants. This is the pure, pious man, the pure, eminent man. When the Quraysh saw him, their spokesman said, liberality terminates at his outstanding qualities. He, be he belongs to the top of glory, which the Arabs of Islam and non-Arabs fall short of reaching. When he comes to touch the wall of the Kaaba, it almost grasps the palm of his hand. This is an intensely moving and intensely deep and loyal poem that is written on behalf of Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam. The story continues that al-Farazdaq is then thrown into jail because of this very moving piece of poetry. Um, and the Imam quietly supports him so that he is not left destitute. Um, but it's worth noting how while there is this understanding that certain types of poetry require a very simple style one that comes from the language of those who were at Karbala. The Imam supports those who go out in support of him and who use the tongue of the culture, the surrounding culture around them to lift up their words and to remember what happens both in Karbala and the importance of the family of the Prophet and the Imams more generally. And so this type of shift really begins to take hold. In the Abbasid period, after the Umayyad Caliphate falls and the Abbasid period comes in with a development of cultural forms, both literary and scientific or just in terms of knowledge, um, we see different developments in the development of history and in the development of poetry and literature. At the same time, the standing of the Ahlul Bayt is very much in flux in this period. 
And that leads to a variety of new poetic genres and a new variety of audiences that are willing to listen to them. In terms of Shia development, there is now an authoritative imam who, who is visible to the community, who can be visited in public with much less fear of retribution at certain times. And furthermore, alongside this, there is an emerging Shia consciousness that encourages the development of specific Shia cultural norms. So during this time period, specifically during the times of Imam Sadiq السلام, and Imam Rida there is a sudden efflorescence in the publication of poetry specifically about Karbala. There are many narrations about Imam Sadiq السلام, inviting in poets into his house and asking them to recite poetry on Karbala for him. Um, and he even corrects one poet. So one poet comes up, comes to his household, and the Imam says, "Please recite poetry for me." He begins to do so, and it, the Imam salam says, "Please recite it in this way," which the poet does. And then the Imam and his household from behind the curtain begin to cry. Furthermore, Imam Rida alayhi salam asks one of the most famous poets associated with Ahlul Bayt, Darbal al Khuzai, to recite poetry for him on the day of Ashura. And so the, when the imam cries and his household also falls in with mourning, and then after the imam pays Darbal for his service, services, this was seen as a service that was worthy of receiving reward from the imam to speak about the Ahlul Bayt and about the tragedy of Karbala in a mournful remember, remembrance. So based on all of this guidance and on the development of the community and on the fact that at times ziyara could be undertaken, there emerges this genre of the poetry of ziyara, the poetry of pilgrimage to the grave of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. This, has a, this body of poetry has a shared purpose, a shared audience, but also shared characteristics. When approaching the grave of the imam, um, it's very common in these poems to see a lot of discussion of what the grave looks like, because the grave, while visitable, while it was possible to do ziyara, the grave was very often um, desecrated, destroyed, flooded, etc., by the by the authorities to make sure that people would not go and visit. And so there comes an entire genre of people talking about the characteristics of the grave itself, how the dirt smelled, how the dirt looked, actually visiting and sinking into the front of the grave of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. In one, in one um, narration, one man is said to, to go back to the grave after it had been flooded. He says the grave, the site of the grave had disappeared. And so one tribesman comes forward and picks up a handful of dirt smells it, puts it back down, moves a little bit, smells a little bit more, puts it back down. And then he picks up a handful and immediately bursts into tears saying that this is the smell of the grave of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Aradu al yakhfu qabrahu an aduwih, fatibu turab ad-dalla ala al-qabri. They intended to hide his grave from his enemies, but the fragrance of the so uh, but the fragrance of the soil of the grave drew people to it. So there's this recognition of just the, the physicality of the space of Karbala at this time period. And along with the recognition of that space is an urge for people to go and do ziyara. They discuss their longing to go and visit the imam and mourn him and how to do that as part of this poetry. A second very common characteristic is discussing the station and maqam of the imam and the blessings that he and the space will actually provide. The providing of rain to the grave. Um, the grave as a space where you can go to remove yourself from the difficulties of the world. Um, the steps of how to do ziyara so that the imam will intercede with you. These are all parts of this poetry that is really termed like the poetry of ziyara. The, the poetry of pilgrimage to the grave of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And so, for example, one poet begins with Marartu ala abiyati ali Muhammadan falam araha amthalaha yawma hallat. 
I pass by the house the houses of Muhammad's family and realize that there are no more like they were. This poet goes on specifically to talk about how um, this land trembled during the day of Karbala. But with all of these characteristics, these poets bring together not just the event of Karbala, the event of Ashura, but the place of Karbala and the ability to go and do ziyara, to marry the remembrance of Imam Hussein alayhi salam with the practice that, Imam, that the Imams have asked of them. And so what we see here is the development of different types of cultural production in response to different needs. Some, store, some forms are in response to narratives in order to better spread the story of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and to refer back to a shared language that those people hearing the story can understand. Some forms are specifically to, to combat the uh, courtly poetry that is being produced in the in descriptions of worldly caliphs and worldly leaders who are often of the Lawi mean by combating that with a poem that is specifically about the maqam of the Ahlul Bayt. And then in the end is a, is a type of poetry that marries the physicality of the space of Karbala and the actions that one is supposed to take when visiting Imam Hussein alayhi salam there. These are some of the earliest forms of poetry that speak specifically about what happens in Karbala, the maqam of Karbala, and how to deal with this very traumatic event for the Muslim community. However, they are only the very beginning forms. They branch off into a variety of customs um, found specifically even among the Buyid and the Hamdanid dynasties once they come to power, and even the Fatimids of Egypt. It branches off into different types of remembrances once, we reach, once, we, once you reach um, Persian mystical poetry and how that incorporates the, the story of Karbala. And up through, for example, the poetry of people like Muhtasham Kashani. And it also reverberates for how we think today about when we do Nohe, nohe and Latsmiya and how we read our Majalis and our Rose, how we incorporate these different ideas into a better understanding of the Imams and the event of Karbala. This is again, a very, very preliminary examination of this early, of this early material and is definitely worthy of more study and again, of more recitation. Thank you very much. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Thank you so much, uh, Sister Amina. It was both a, a scholarly and also a touching uh, the lecture for us. So we all enjoyed here. So we are roughly 20 people or 25 people inside the room and there are 21 people online. So all of us enjoyed a lot. We have time for, before the add-on, the, the, the macro add-on, we have time for a few minutes of questions. If somebody in the audience or in the uh, Zoom can unmute uh, himself or herself, so we can have one or two questions. So one, one thing to start, I guess we have a question in chat maybe. Uh, no, uh, so you, you can also have written question too. So one thing also, do you, uh, did you look at the uh, like the way imams uh, describe this po poetry uh, about the Ahlul Bayt on a, like a theological or the spiritual uh, like aspect? I just uh, remembering of two like the independent hadith from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. One is saying that whoever makes a ver a bait for us, like bait a verse, uh, Allah makes a, a bait or a house in the Jannah for, for him, for like him, or it can be her too. Uh, and the other interesting hadith is, even is the theologically more eloquent is uh, that whoever makes a verse like for us, uh, Ruhul Qudus would come and uh, do does the ta'yid that confirms that. So it is such a, like very eloquent, like a very high level of, it's just the Ruhul Qudus come like with what Isa alayhi salam in the Quran. But it says a poet, it can be for a poet of Ahlul Bayt too. So it was, have you uh, touched upon these hadiths or others? Um, 
I did see them. They're actually part of those two um, hadith that I, I actually mentioned them very much in passing. There were two hadith where the Imam salam, invites poets in and asks them to remember Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And then he, after he finishes weeping, he says, whoever writes a line of poetry for us, uh, a bait of poetry, he will be rem- he will be given a, a bait in Jannah or he will be given a certain amount of reward. Um, and that's the thing is that the use of these types of narratives to keep the story of Imam Hussein alayhi salam alive and for people to remember and incorporate it into their into their lives was part of the centrality of Karbala from the very beginning. And so it is, I think, part of the reason why Imam Sadaq alayhi salam talks about it in this way, that not only is it just a performative thing, but it is a spreading of the message. Khalid Sandawi talks about this specifically as a way that the story of the Imams and the message of the imams um, disseminates or spreads among the people. This is one of the most effective ways in, the, in that time that, that information and material can disseminate. And so that is part of that ajit, I think, is that you are spreading the, the message of the imams. But I don't want to get too much into speculation on why that ajit is there um, and why the imam speaks that way. But I think that part is quite clear. Yeah, thank you so much. Make many sense. Uh, so, any can I have one more question, online or in person? Okay, so we can move forward. Like Azan is coming. Oh, there is. Okay, there is one question in chat. Please introduce some books for such a poem in English language. If you if you didn't already, which are free do- free and downloadable. So this was a very applied question. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have any off of the top of my head that are in English. That's the the major problem. Most of the material that I found here was called from other sources, but I can um, link to a couple of good translations in the chat while prayer while prayer is happening. Um, one is for a translation of Al-Farazdaq's poem about Imam Zayn al-Abidin alayhi salam. And I think the other one is about one of the earliest um, elegies for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So I'll put the links in the chat and see if I can find any more. But unfortunately, no, that's part of the problem is that there, I don't have any um, links to very good books in English that are all, even free or not that are available. So I'll put in the website links for now. That's great. Did the professor Tara Kutputin uh, write ah. any book on that aspect? So she has one paper about mm-hmm. like the lady like the Zainab yes. lady man but I don't know if there was there was some, there was they were not in poetry almost there was like it's their lectures sermons yes but their there orations any- and that's actually a very good chapter her book touches on the orations of Imam Hussein alayhi salam in Karbala as well I think so um if anybody wants to look into that I can put the title of the book if people want to look at that but no that's not poetry that is a very different format but it is also a very important form of literature at this time period. Um, I know that she has some material on Fatimid poets who speak about Karbala, but um, nothing specific comes to mind. If I find anything, again, I can add it to the chat or I can send it to you to disseminate. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we will uh, have a starting the prayer, but in 20 minutes, we start to have the uh, the morning ritual uh, following that so people can uh, stay online and do other stuff and then come back uh, but please recite the uh, salavat for uh, our sister uh, Amina Yuwan Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad ajil fresh